You ready? Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Como vai? Welcome to episode 72 of the Soupy Podcast. It is I, Polo Peranta, your host. And I'm back at uh, Brooklyn Podcasting Studio. Haven't seen Josh in a long time. Hello, Josh. How you doing, buddy? We have a guest. He uh, he has a he has a company called Original Sin. You know, if 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 you guys like cider, love cider like me, this is the one, Mr. Gideon. Yep, thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. How you doing, brother? Good. Welcome to the show. Appreciate it. So, um, what? I mean, we could just get right into it. Um, how did Original Sin come into existence? Like, like what what drove you? All right, so. Original Sin goes back 27 years. Okay. So I was sitting in a, a bar in, in the um, uh, downtown New York yeah. uh, called the old Kettle Fish mm-hmm. right next to West 4th Street. <clears throat> I was meeting a friend of mine um, named Banjo Pete who used to play in underground clubs like the Banjo. And he was going to start a business <clears throat> in which he would um, take uh, vintage cars and give people tours of, like, the, of, the, of, the, of uh, the village because he's sort of a, a bit of a his, history buff. And, and so, you know, I was sitting with him and I got served a pint of really sweet cider. I was like, dude, that's it. If you want to start a business, why isn't there like a really good dry cider in this country? So that was kind of the beginning of it. Um, then I got access to a little uh, facility in upstate New York, started taking little mixes, uh, bringing it to people in like you know, East Village and Brooklyn in different bars and have people try it. And then after like six months of doing that, um, I, my friend Banjo had a, a Jeep a, 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 a old truck. We literally launched it in New York City, only to find like no distributors wanted to carry cider. They didn't think there was opportunity for cider in this country. Um, and I just simply, for the first uh, six months, walked you know each street in New York City, literally thousands of times, going bar to bar, you know, trying to sell it in. Um, at the time, the craft. Uh, so yeah, as I started the thing with no, no money mm. and just with no background in the industry, and you know. I, I wasn't necessarily, I didn't have a sales, you know, person as, you know, the skill set, but literally I would be um, relentless and eventually developed like a really great list of bars in, in New York City stock in it, including places like CBGB's and Max Fish mm-hmm. and just a lot of amazing places. Um, and at the time, I w- uh, the Brooklyn Brewery was the craft distributor in, in New York. Mm-hmm. And I would uh, fax when owners before, like e- people email, <laughs> I was like fax when the owners of the Brooklyn Brewery. Um, every few weeks, telling them what accounts I had. Eventually, the list got so good, they t- brought the product in, which was a really big break for me. Eventually, Brooklyn Brewery got out of the distribution business and sold their rights to uh, Union Beer, which is a big distributor in Brooklyn. And that kind of took it to a little higher level mm-hmm. in New York. That's how the thing got started. So. Yeah. So how many? So are you just New York-based now, or are you all over? No. Nah, so, you know, we were one of, at the time I started, once again, there was really no cider, very little cider in this country. And the only things that really were being sold were kind of very sweet products. So, uh, you know, I was really one of the first couple dozen cideries. And, you know, over time, you know, we're now sold in 27 states, a little bit inter- in, sold in Japan also. Oh, wow. um, but it's simply been going, you know, through um, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, really hustling. Mm-hmm. Um, and as well as I got fortunate a bunch of years ago, I got a really great artist who sort of elevated the brand and like and we started doing like and it's got the the brand like kind of better known and sort of really helped out mm-hmm. in terms of brand image and sort of stuff. So. so I know, you know, you say you started it on yourself. So now is it like you and like a big team or you and a small team? It's you really small team and yeah. still like it's kind of, you know, once again, we've been independent for 27 years. Once again, bootstrapped from the beginning, never really raised any money. Um, and the you know we we do we produce in two facilities, uh, um, one in near Syracuse and one up uh, a, a second one, mm. and uh, we it's a pretty tight tight team. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I mean, you saying you're in like twenty twenty seven states. Yeah, that's a lot of states. It's man. a lot of states. Yeah, and it's but like it's, so, you know, of the twenty seven states, so you're like. Do you go go visit or do you have people? Like, how do you, you know, I don't, how do you I manage really have, that I don't really, we don't really have the people. So, like, yeah, so it, how do you manage that for process? like, uh, there were times I was traveling, like, before actually more, like, I would travel 15 states a year, literally walk the streets in all the cities, you know, where we were in. And eventually the product developed a bit of a following. And, you know, fortunately now I rely on really great distributors who make a real big effort to push it. Nice. So it's kind of really sort of a nice thing. Nice. There's like a nice momentum 
you know, but the one thing you have to realize about cider is that cider is a ver is still a very niche thing. So yeah. when I started, people didn't think there was any real market for cider in this country. And there's only a couple dozen maybe ciders at most. Today, there's um, 1,200 cideries. Um, but still, cider in America is only 1.7% of the beer market, where in England, it's like 17% of the beer market. In Australia and you know other parts of the, country, uh, the world, it's much more significant. So like as much as the industry has kind of grown, and, I, and I've kind of seen the industry grow, it's still sort of niche and maybe not developed yet uh, to the level that we all hope it will eventually get. Mm -hmm. so. so your thing is like you're trying to like get to England and get to Australia. Yeah, we sold in England for a few years. Yeah. There was like a situation where uh, there was a bunch of English. There's a, at the point, there's a point where there's a lot of craft, American craft beer being sold in England. Mm -hmm. And those craft some of those, one of those craft distributors really wanted a uh, U.S. cider. And we were selling in England doing really well for a while. But there's been kind of a, one is actually craft beer, American craft beer, is, for, things change yeah. in the industry. Yeah. So one thing about this business is like literally things, the trends and change almost overnight. So, you know, it's, it's yeah. so. And um, what are the different brands? I know we got some varieties Yeah, so here. like the one closest to you was, that's, the, the, that's kind of the start of the that's company. That's like the very first yeah. one, right? So it's sort of like a nice dry cider, uh, you know, almost more like an English pub cider. Uh -huh. That one is our new non-alcoholic. Um, it's one of the, we have four non-alcoholics, some called Dragon Widow, maybe with so, dragon fruit. Okay, let me ask you. So what's what's the benefit of having a non-alcoholic cider? I'm just saying, I'm yeah, just, yeah, no, no, just no. You know, I think this, this thing now where, you know, one, people are drinking less. Um, people want to go to bars and have something a little more interesting. Mm -hmm. This is a non-alcoholic cider made with apple cider vinegar. This is kind of, it's low calorie too, and it's but it's very full flavored. So like people are looking, is this a lot more people who want to go to bars but not necessarily drink as much? And as, there's, you know, obviously there's a lot of uh, any uh, non-alcoholic craft beers, but there's nothing on the market that was sort of a non-alcoholic cider that wasn't just like fresh juice. Mm -hmm. So this one's kind of a little more co complex, a little more interesting. You know, bars, you know, taking it and doing like mixology with it. But it's actually been, you know, very successful. Yeah. In, in New York City, so. Hey, Josh, he sounds like you. Yeah. First thing Josh told me, I don't drink like I used to. Yeah. No, I've been definitely drinking. I've been, yeah, I've been definitely drinking a lot less also, man. So. Okay. And and the third one, what's the third one? That is sort of the lifeblood of the business. That one came okay. out about seven years ago. <laughs> and like from the moment that brand hit the market, sales have gone up every month. And it's a freshly pressed New York apples with blackberries. It's got, you know, it's kind of a medium dry, medium sweet, sort of right in the middle. Oh, so it's and, mixed with blackberries. Yes, yeah, blackberry, yeah. Oh. And uh, whatever reason, that brand okay. we're between... Gonna, yeah. We're going to try this. We're going to try this. this is I appreciate it. Mixture. Mm. Yeah. I can see why they like it. Because I can taste the blackberries, but I can taste the cider. Yeah. No, we're using real high quality blackberries. Like, costs a fortune to make. Uh, but, you know, it just... It's, it, you know, Using berries is berries tend to be more complex. So when you yeah. add them to the juice, they have like kind of a, a depth to them. Yeah. And I think you know the name Black Widow. I, you know, obviously, my my artist has been working with me for many years. Mm -hmm. uh, came up with a you know, cool design and just sort of the, you know the products just kind of hit like a, no, I taste it, so. but I taste the difference. Yeah. You know, because I've I've drinking a, a lot, um, a lot of ciders, and uh, it's definitely like you you taste the mixture. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of good. There's also with cider this sort of an interesting, like some people really like dry ciders, yeah, and some people like in sweet ciders. But there's definitely, you know, probably a little uh, bigger opportunity for, you know, fruited ciders, which allow people to get sort of, a, you know, range of complexity, but you know, hopefully very drinkable as well. You haven't thought of doing one uh, with grapes. We've thought of it. We played around with it. We haven't come up with the right recipe yet. But we have played around with it. So grapes with the apples. Yeah. Come on, bro. No, no, definitely. There you so. go. But um, so what I was gonna say, see, I, I I lost my train of thought. Yeah. With uh drinking these blueberries, <laughs> um, how'd you come up with the name? That I was sitting in a, the old Max Fish, the second Max Fish, you know, which was on. Um, I remember the first Max Fish, which is great. On remember Le that on one? Street. Yeah, it's awesome. <sighs> yeah, awesome nights. That's a great bar. Let me tell you, the the the, the New York night scene is just not what it, it's just not. I tell people like stuff like you say CBGBs. Yeah, I, I was in CBGBs. Yeah, um, it's just not what it used to be. Yeah, 
It's, uh, it's literally a memory, like. I mean, I think that there still are like some remnants down there. Yeah, and, but like, it's not. You know, be, like you know, like Arlene's grocery, maybe yeah. you know. Yeah. But like, yeah, it's sort of unfortunately, this the, the pace of change in the city is so significant, and you, things get priced out. I think for, for, for Max Fish got priced out twice. Yeah. Because they were they got priced out. Like the old spot got made into a hotel. So they lost their spot and they moved to Orchard Street and then also, but you know, those those guys, you really made a big effort to support artists mm -hmm. and uh, you know, and it, it is a shame, you know. Yeah. But but I think there is an element, I I mean you probably know better than me, is like, you know, the, the art scene's always moving somewhere, whether yeah. you know, parts of Brooklyn or Queens, wherever it is at Bronx. It'll survive. You know, yeah. But um just the way the way the way we are just with the society is is like a lot of stuff is getting pushed out. Yeah. Um just with the economical sense of things, you know, like people can't afford anything no more. Yeah. You know? Yeah. To get a haircut's like sixty bucks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I ain't getting no haircut. <laughs> no, I think that, you know what yeah. I'm saying? I like I go old school to haircut. You know, I I'll so. go get a razor and yeah, a shaver yeah, yeah. and yeah. call it a call it a day. Yeah. Um no, it's definitely true. I mean, it's also this change, like people, you know, the craft, you know, you know, people want the mixology bars. It's not really the thing that I'm into, right? But whatever, you know, it kind of changes in terms of people, what people are looking for in terms of where they yeah. want to spend their time. I mean, but so. you are, you did hit a point of stuff getting priced out. Um, but you see it. You just see it, I mean, on all levels. I mean, I mean, I think me and Johnson talked about that, even in this neighborhood. Yeah. You know, you can see stuff coming in. The big corporations are coming in, and everything little is getting pushed right out. I mean, you look at like Seventh uh, Avenue, Fifth Avenue, and, and Park Slope compared yeah. to what it was many years ago. Yeah, it's you wouldn't even recognize it compared to the, the look. You know, the establishments are here. But not that it, you know, they're not like great places now, but it's just you know, yeah, it just changes quickly. Yeah, I remember if you guys remember Southpaw and, and yeah, Park Slope, I, remember Southpaw. I, remember Southpaw. Last, yeah. I remember Southpaw. I remember the last. I remember the last night of Southpaw. Yeah. The very last night, they used to have the things that are doing the summer where they had the concerts in the street, and you remember, you remember stuff like that. Those guys were great owners, man. They're yeah. really into music scenes. <sighs> Come yeah, on, man. So. you talk to the gospel right now. Yeah. So, but as a as a business owner and an entrepreneur, so how do you how do you get through this stuff? Because you know, there's there's inflation. Yeah. It costs, you know, probably a lot more to produce your stuff. Um. How do you weather this storm that we're going through? Because everybody's going through it, whether yeah. it's, you know, you're doing this or I'm doing that. You know, keep, you know, like uh, you were talking about business before, you know, you keep the expenses down. Yeah. You know, keep it tight, you know, and try to, you know, and you have to hu just hustle. Try to hustle. Yeah. Hu right? Hustle is a 24-7 yeah. thing. I mean, I think the one thing about New York City, to sh shout out here is that, um, like, you look at old bars, for me, like, nobody has to support your product. And, you know, every place that has supported me, you know, I don't even, I'm incredibly grateful. I, I, you know, throw out a few names, like other great places, you know, I mean, you know, with Spring Street Lounge down Nolita or yeah. Beauty Bar on 14th Street. Oh, Beauty Bar is yeah, amazing, that's bro. What, that guy, Mike's owner, has been supporting me forever. And once again, you can be sure that almost every bar in New York City get, gets literally approached by like 40, 40 salespeople a week bro, <laughs> looking is, to try to knock you out. Your name is some legendary bars, bro, yeah, by the way. Yeah. You know, if anybody knows. Yeah. So that's yeah. what I'm saying. They're still, they're still out there, right? right. You know, out of Shrunk your head down the block, you have a couple blocks. Now, there's still a lot of great spots, mm -hmm. but like, um, but once again, you know, the nice thing about New York, as tough as it is in New York, that like, there are people they'll go out of the way to support you, even if you know, obviously, maybe economically, it's easier to take free stuff from somebody else, and right, right, right. you know, but right. we want to support small companies. So I think that's kind of nice. So. No, that's yeah. awesome. Bro. So, so um, I see you. I mean, you you're doing a lot of expansion. Yeah. Um. Do you think that it's getting easier for you as far as like, because I mean, because you, you know, you hustle every day, but yeah. do you kind of see like it's getting to the point where it's like, okay, well, I got this going here, I got this going there? You know, a lot, you know, uh, for me, you know, there's definitely, you know, the, the business is taking a few different directions. Actually, one thing, I don't know if you know this, is that uh, about 12, you know, one thing about the cider industry, a lot of people got into cider. All right, this is a weird, crazy man, mm -hmm. or orchardist, right? Yeah. So when you go to like, so I'm actually the only, I think I'm only either one of two or three people, maybe the only person who's been to every national cider conference, which has happened, started, I think, 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. So 12 years ago in Salem, Oregon, there was a meeting of 40 people who wanted to make cider a big deal in this country. 
And I'd already been beating the streets in New York City and right. pretty freaking cynical, man, because it wasn't easy going bar to bar in New York, right? Mm -hmm. And I, uh, But I went out there and, and I kind of went out just for the sake of going out. And I heard these people stand up and like imagine that cider one day would be big in this country and that this one meeting of 40 people would eventually become a thousand people. Mm -hmm. And they were right. Like that first meeting was in Salem, Oregon, 40 people. The next year was in Chicago, like 380 people. And now as many as like 1,400 people come to the National Cider Conference. So like, I feel kind of one really honored to like witness all that growth. Mm -hmm. And sort of the people in the cider industry is very interesting because cider people aren't really necessarily busy. You know, there are some, mm -hmm. but like a lot of people in the industry because they're just really passionate about cider. And there's also a lot of orchardists actually uh, that are in it. They're looking for like a secondary thing to sell. So if you go to upstate New York, you might see an orchard that sells cider on the side. And, um, you know, it's a way to, you know, have something else in their tasting room. Um, and actually today, uh, there's a hundred, you know, when I, once again, when I started, there's only a couple ciders in New York. <clears throat> today is 126 ciders in New York State, which is the most amount oh, of wow. ciders in the country, uh -huh. ciders in the country. And you actually, New York State is the second biggest apple producing state in the country. So they kind of go hand in hand. One thing about New York State is that a lot of old orchards that grow these old time apples like Baldwin's or Max or, you know, Ida Reds that make a little more complex cider. And as, as a result, like the cider in New York is very different than cider in other parts of the country and like really heralded as being kind of special, mm -hmm. you know, in, ter in terms of that as well. But for me, um, upon me traveling and becoming friends with orchards in Michigan and New York and all over the country in Washington State, um, I got, and I'm actually also visiting um, in, you know, Cornell University there, and also USDA, mm -hmm. Orchards of Geneva, New York, has an orchard with 2,500 different varieties of apples, right. where you know the average is 12 varieties of apples represent 88% of what you see in supermarkets, and the average Americans only had you know six varieties in their lifetime. There are over 7,500 varieties of apples, and some of them with crazy flavor profiles. Yeah. So just learning about that, uh, 12 years ago I started a small orchard on two, two acres of land, about 120 miles in New York City, and now we grow 150 varieties of apples. So like wow. kind of a nice thing beyond just the cider has been kind of getting into the agricultural element of it yeah. and just seeing how cool that part of it is as well. So, so. it's literally different different types of apples. Yeah. Like there's apples that taste like pineapples, there's apples that taste like pears, there's apples that like like look like stars. There's on an the tree. apple that tastes like pineapple. Yeah, it's called the Pitmas and Pineapple. Sign me up. <laughs> so it's an apple that originates from uh England. Yeah. Um there's apples red flesh we grow twelve red flesh varieties. Um we grow Apples that are conical from Turkey that look like crazy shapes. One, it's called Kandil Snap. Mm. You know, it's this crazy shaped apple. And our li the little orchard we started is called we call it the Hudson Valley Apple Project. And we do a we we sell our apples at a little farmers market in Columbia County in in uh, the town of Hillsdale up, mm. there, up there. Yeah. And then afterwards, we do tours every weekend on Saturdays where people can come up and we walk them down each rows and they can just see all these crazy apples. I think he was telling me something about the you was doing. That's why you were going. Yeah, going, yeah, yeah I go up there every for, weekend. Yeah, because you know that I go up every week. I, we, yeah, I planted every tree. <laughs> it's six hundred fifty right. trees. I literally dug every hole, um, and I take care of it all. Bro, and, that, but that it, sounds amazing. Bro. Yeah, it's it's been fun, man. Because it just adds like this really cool dimension to an industry that is incredibly multi-dimensional and just so many levels in terms of what's again the people who are involved and and the history of cider and the history. You know, all of it's great. It's just mm -hmm. cool, cool stuff, man. The more you learn, the cooler it is. So. Yeah, because as an apple juice fan like myself, yeah, <laughs> I was like, "What was next?" And actually, like, giving you one thing, yeah. like um, in New York City, <clears throat> there's so much history to this. Also, like if you go to 13th and Third, 13th mm -hmm. Street and Third Avenue, you're yeah. gonna see a plaque on the wall yeah. that says, "This is the site of the pear tree. The very first pear tree ever brought to America yeah. was brought by Peter Stuyvesant and planted in the 16 late 1660s, right, in, on the corner of 13th and Third. And pear trees can last like 500 years. And literally this whole city developed around this pear tree. So when, as you know, these, these villages became, actually, so the, the Bowery in Dutch means farm. Mm -hmm. And actually Peter Stuyvesant's orchard was in the Bowery. Mm -hmm. So like you just think of you know, New York City used to be agricultural land, right? So, but this one tree, like this whole city built around it and it became this famous tree of this one pear tree sitting on the city where there's no more, you know, fruit trees around. But eventually, I think in the mid 1800s or the 1800s, there was like a wagon came, knocked over the tree, mm. and the tree was finally, you know, succumbed to, you know, to uh, to that accident. 
but there's still a plaque on on that 13th and 3rd, which marks the spot of that tree. It just shows you like kind of the history of fruit trees and agriculture in New York City. Um, there's also like a lot of famous, uh, when it comes to, um, you know, apples here, like the most famous apple in this country originates from Queens, New York, from East, uh, from, um, from uh, Flushing, mm -hmm. called the Newtown Pippin. And literally when, uh, you know, the early days of our country, when we were an agrarian nation, mm -hmm. there were nothing we were more proud of than like the fruit grown in America. And it said the greatest variety of apple in the early days of our country was the Newtown Pippin. So if you were like some amateur orchardist in, um, in this country, you would go to East Bloomfield, New York, make a little cut of a graft, uh, cyan wood from that tree and try to gr maybe graft in your backyard to grow this amazing apple. And so much so, it was so famous when Benjamin Franklin went to England in 1759, he brought barrels of it to show the English how great the apple's grown in this country. And eventually, a huge export business originated from New York to England of this Newtown Pippin, where like all the early writings talks about it being this amazing apple, maybe the greatest apple of the world. So oh, nice. It's kind of all... Jeez Louise. Yeah. So it goes deep. So anyway, anyway, history. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm giving you history lessons now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if we talk, yeah, so I don't no, know. I mean, no, this is dope. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, going a little about art. I know that's like, you know, we, my art is like, so in about a few years after I started, I put a little ad in Craigslist, like it was like, you know, $20 ad. Yeah. Uh, you know, small company is an artist. We don't have any money. So, you know, I was hoping to get like, you know, SVA or parts, you know, some, some student that probably gets, you know, be happy to work for a small company, probably gets it much better. Than anybody else gets it because maybe they're hanging out in the bars we're talking about and i got a response from a rock poster artist in california named r black who there used to be a website called gig posters mm -hmm. where if you did art for a rock uh like a rock concert you put your art on the site and um i saw his art I was like holy shit, this is fucking awesome and he did one poster it's like a pinup poster and it was so good and i said you're the artist as long as you want to be my artist and we started doing a series of art featuring real people from new york city mm -hmm. And it, this is before, like, obviously Instagram and Facebook and all that stuff. But it became a little viral where people would contact us and want to be on posters. We started doing, like, little events, like Double Down Saloon in East, East Village and Beauty Bar and a few other spots. And um, so, you know, that, that artist literally, once again, in an industry where there's a lot of cideries and it's, you know, probably not as big as it should be, like, having really good art. A great art yeah. and you know, it means everything especially when for a company that's not really financed you know so i got you know the artist names are black and incredible props to him oh, and nice. in terms of just helping us you know become you know you know obviously really just stay in business man yeah so you know yeah no so. that's no that's dope so so uh what so what you think is next for your company you know you know keep on you know, a lot of you know as a small company you know where things are still kind of bootstrapped you know a lot of it is the best way probably to grow would be coming up with like the next cool brand and like you're saying like grapes you know I, something I, yeah, I yeah i think i think grapes and uh cider would be different yeah because if you can do blueberries yeah and trust me i didn't think i'm not a big blueberry fan but it goes good with the it goes great with the cider yeah no you know? it's not definitely but like you know one thing is definitely come out with good brands you know you know, obviously hopefully continue to hopefully make good you know good hopefully you know better cider you know it's all about the product you put out man like the best return when it comes to you know businesses is you hopefully you make a really good product and mm -hmm. people respond well to it it's like you know i think if you don't have the feet on the street or you know that's got to be everything is you got to put the effort in making a good product no, so that sounds no, that sounds good uh are you are you keen to like cross branding with other like companies? Yeah, and... we used to do a lot of it in our first few years. I don't do any of it anymore. Yeah, but I would be happy to do it. Yeah, but um, yeah, we you know definitely so. Yeah, you know, I'm just saying like little things that can always push a brand further. Yeah, I mean honestly, to you like it's beyond me. Remember, social, our social media sucks, yeah. and like you know, they you know obviously these are things you need to be good at these days and. Uh, no, so, you, so you need me on your social media yeah, team. Yeah, Girl, yeah exactly. I, I yeah. get up on there. Yeah. You have a post every day. <laughs> so. Yeah, social media, I think for you is very important because you need to push out. Like you have all these awesome brands. Yeah. But there's like there's people that only will look at it through social media. Yeah. You know, so I think, you know, that's something you 
you should be doing. Yeah. <laughs> and that's tough, though. It's tough to do it right. Yeah, so it's not so yeah, easy. Yeah, I mean, the thing I... The thing I say about content, because I do produce a lot of content, is uh, you just have to use, like, every every day you get a new thing of content. Like, today, you're on a podcast. So you should have a picture of you and, and the beer. Yeah. And boom, like, Original Sin was on, blah, 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 blah. You know what I'm saying? Because then it brings eyes that you wouldn't have had. Yeah. You know? Like, when this video come out, people are like, oh, Original Sin. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. It, yeah. goes, it goes hand in hand. You just have to like every day. Yeah. Um. You, you may not post all the content every day, but you should at least have one thing every day. Yeah. And you just post it. Yeah. I mean, listen, it's all about like a face to name to brand. Like it's got to be a storyline, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's not so easy to do well. So no, 100%, man. Mm -hmm. So. Sounds like you need a social media manager, Gideon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That's what it so, sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I can help you. Anyway, um, so what? So do you do the merch aspect of the of your brand a lot, or you just do it just? Uh, you know, merch. We had yeah. the, the series of posters. Yeah. Uh, we, you know, we we don't push it really hard. Um, probably should push it more. Yeah. But you know, we don't push it that hard though. So. so I'm telling you, I always tell people this, like business owners or people that make clothes. I always tell them, and Josh is my witness. The merch is a, is a very important thing, even yeah. for even for this. Yeah. Because anything you can put on here, you can put on a shirt. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It'll just bring brand rec recognition, right? Recognition or recognition? Recognition. Yeah. Recognition, yeah. yeah. You know. See, I'm I mean, so the one thing I would say, if I did something, well, I do, stuff we do, like you'd like to do something just like a little different than anybody else is doing, which you got to do anyway, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's got to do it yeah. differently. But but I, mean, not, I agree. So. Whew. <laughs> but yeah, this is like the first episode where I'm openly drinking, so. <laughs> so Josh, did you like yours? Oh yeah, man. I, like, it's perfectly what is it called? It's perfectly like in the middle in terms yeah. of the ingredient. Like what what's called? what apples are these? So that is a mixture of a, a few apples, like uh mostly, you know, Ida Red, Max, Baldwins, you know, things you can get in upstate New York on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Actually there's a lot of northern spy in that which is another great apple. It's an apple that originates from East Bloomfield, New York. Mm -hmm. And that apple is so famous that if you go to eat the town of East Bloomfield, yeah. the, as you walk in the town, it, they say, welcome to East Bloomfield, the home of the Northern Spy apple. And there's a plaque that marks the spot of the original tree. Oh, wow. And that, so Northern Spy apple was the fourth most popular apple in America um, as of 1900. And some people, pundits, claim it's the greatest apple ever grown in this country, but it's kind of been forgot to history, but it's got like a lot of rich flavor to it. So like it's a great apple to use for cider, and once again, it's grown in New York. So th those are things that make it better. But actually, I'm drinking the same one you're drinking. Yeah. And actually, the largest cider competition in the country every year is in Michigan in Grand Rapids, and it's, it's as many as like 1,700 entries. And this one won a gold medal a few years ago, like you know. So really good. yeah, so it's kind of got you know definitely kind of proud of that. We've won we've won uh, four gold medals at uh, at that that uh, Glen Cap, which is that competition. So. This is a blend, yeah. A lot of blend. We do some single varietals, and actually, our, I'm really into the history of apples. So, like on each single varietal, it'll tell you the history of the apple on the back of it. Because um, I kind of, I think the more people get into apples and find it interesting and just understand it's so much more than Red Delicious, Granny Smith, you know, it just makes cider cooler. Also, so like I'm really into single, like the single varietals, and just to show you, if you use this apple, it's going to taste like this. But if you use this apple, it's going to taste like that. And then understand the 7,500 varieties of apples. So, like, what the flavor profile of cider can be is just out of control. And even that pick mass and pineapple, the one tastes like a pineapple, mm. it ferments up to, it's got 20, over 20 bricks, which means it ferments up to, like, 10% alcohol. So, like, there are ciders that almost taste like champagne, and they're as alcoholic as, like, maybe champagne. So, like, that's just this wide range of what, what cider can be and will become because, you know, over the last 50, 10, decade, people are planting all these old apples and they're starting to become available. And all of this country, there are artisanal cider makers who are growing these really cool apples and making these really great ciders. Mm -hmm. You know, actually in New York State, you have different regions. You have like the Hudson Valley where there's a pretty amazing scene going on. And you also have like the Finger Lakes, you know, the Western New York too, but like the Finger Lakes, he likes to think of themselves kind of as like the Sonoma of cider. Like, and if you go up there, there's just, you know, just once again, a lot of this amazing people 
that have really committed themselves. And like if you, you know, like you go to England now, if you went to like Herefordshire and Somerset and travel through the countryside, you'd see these orchards with literally three, four, or five generations of people that have been making cider. But you know, give it like 20, 30 years for cider, and you'll travel up to Hudson Valley or to the Finger Lakes, and you'll see the same history. Like it's going to become integral part of the history of this country again, mm -hmm. but it's just going to take some time for it to happen. So. I believe, I, I, I believe, I believe it's good. So we're going to wrap this episode up. Ah, oh, man, this was, this, this, this was good. Yo, thank you for having me on, man. Uh, yeah, it was like, I don't, I don't usually drink, but this was, this is actually worth it. I'm still trying to finish it though, but you know, that's my tolerance down the, down to here. <laughs> Woo. Anyway, yeah, appreciate it. So, where can they find you? Like, if you want to be found, because people sometimes yeah. come on here and be like, "Yo, no, don't don't find me." I'm yeah. So, in New York City, you know, check, yeah, visit our website. You know, mm -hmm. so richson dot com. But you know, selling you know, Wegmans has us in um, you know a decent number of you know great places ha ha have us, um, and you definitely a little more in bars. You know, like yeah. obviously Beauty Bar, right, 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 um, Arlene's Grocery, Spring Street Lounge some of the cool spots is there um any any places online that they can purchase yeah we do sell some online Not, uh, actually we don't ship in new york state which is sort of a weird thing with laws that we need to get approval for but um you know we ship to like <clears throat> you can order 38 states in the country through the website too so okay so, so but so, so new york <clears throat> is more so like um you said uh so you're in like supermarkets and stuff. We're in like decent amount of supermarkets. We could be probably more more chains than we are in. But actually, one cool thing is our non-alcoholic ones. There's there's dust regulations. You can get that on Amazon. So oh, we, okay. just came, we came up with four non-alcoholic ciders. We have like a widow family uh, twelve pack made up of these different widows. Yeah. So this one's a dragon widow. We got a white widow. We got um a golden widow, and we got a widow's tea. And they're all really good. What's the golden actually, widow? The golden widow is just uh, lemonade, like a, a like a lemon juice one. What? I should have brought that with. But actually, that. I got a French a named Rebecca who yeah. helped me give her a lot of credit. She helped me develop <laughs> the recipe. A nice thing about New York City, actually, is, can I tell you one thing? There's one yeah. great book. It was called um, The Warhol Effect. And it was a, it was written by like a, um, this woman who said, actually, she talks about Max Fish. She said the one thing about New York City um, when it comes to art is in you could go to Max Fish. This book was written a while ago where you could have an artist next to a hedge fund manager next to someone else and they they all come together and things can happen in New York City that don't happen anywhere else. And that's what makes New York City so special in terms of creativity and ideas. But for me, like I, I met this amazing woman, uh, Rebecca Dungrove, who um, worked at uh, many years of background in food science. Mm -hmm. And when I was working on the non-alcoholic, she really aided me, kind of walking me through some ingredients I wasn't used to using. And it's been like really well received. It's sort of a really nice little add on to our, to the business and kind of have high hopes for it. Nice. But um, just shows you like being in New York City, you know, and getting out and about can. Yeah, you, know, yeah. you never things. know who you talk to. Yeah. Know. So you talk to a complete stranger. Next thing you know, they own this, this, that, and want yeah. to help you do this. Yeah. Awesome, man. Yeah, it makes it say so great, right? That's why I've been here. You know, you were all been here. <laughs> it's been all leave. It's hard to leave. It's hard to leave New York, right? It's hard to There's leave. nothing like New York. It's hard to leave. There's nothing like New York. So. But yeah, you can find me on Instagram, Polo Parata, the Super Beef Podcast on YouTube and Instagram and anywhere podcasts are found. You can also find us on what's that thing? Patreon. For five dollars, you get this episode and a whole bunch of other episodes early. Or you may have to wait because I'm still, you know, the season eight hasn't officially came uh, come out. It comes out on the 29th. I have an episode already locked and loaded, so you'll get that one. And then you'll get Gideon the following week. So, man, it's been a pleasure. I don't know. I can't say thank you enough, man. Appreciate it. You know, thank so, you for coming through. Thanks. Um, if you got, if you want to come back, you're always welcome. Bring some more yeah, refreshments. Anytime. anytime. You got to make sure you bring Josh the lemonade. All right. <laughs> so cause you he, gotta try the ones I left in the fridge. You gotta try this one. This one's good. The dragon oh yeah, widow. Nah, nah. So, <laughs> you know, you know, we take it. I brought you the good one. They, all of them are good. Though. We no, take it. We so, so, one of these going home. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's a pleasure. Thank yeah, you for coming man, appreciate on. Appreciate it, man. And uh, we'll, we'll 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 check you all later. Another episode coming sooner than you think. Soupy podcast to uh, pull apart the out. Ciao. That's it. Yo, appreciate it. <laughs> that was fun. Yeah. I was actually nervous in the beginning. I, I, Did you see that? I can like, tell you were nervous in the beginning.